Good evening. Our subject now is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But first of all, I'm delighted to say that the latest probe to Mars, Mars Polar Lander, is safe on its way, and next December it will land in the Martian Antarctic. Will it find any trace of life? Well, um, I don't know. Watch this space. But meanwhile, I'm delighted to introduce Ian Morrison from George Royal Bank, mm -hmm. who's heavily involved in the city. Well, Ian, are there other beings up there? Well, we certainly hope so. There's an equation called the Drake Equation. It actually looks very complicated, but really it's just a number of factors which, when you multiply them together, give us a chance of estimating the number of other civilizations that perhaps we could contact. The first factor is the rate at which suitable stars are being formed. If we look at the Orion Nebula mm -hmm. in the Sword of Orion, we actually see a birthplace of stars, a stellar nursery. And we have a very good idea how rapidly, how often, different types of stars are formed. But they're not all suitable. No. They're all very different. You've got Betelgeuse at the top left of Orion, Rigel down on the lower right. They're both very massive stars. Betelgeuse Ridge, Rigel White. Exactly. And they burn up their energy very, very quickly. We think probably a star has to live for perhaps 3,000 million years to give life a reasonable chance to evolve. And those certainly don't. But they're very important because as they burn up their fuel with nuclear fusion, they build up elements inside which are then thrown out into space in the supernova explosions at the end of their life. And that provides the material for planets like our Earth to form. If we zoom right into the heart of Orion, you can actually see stars forming, protostars. And some of them are surrounded by a dark disk. This is dust out of which planets might actually form. And we do need planets because life couldn't exist on the surface of a star, it's too hot. Out in the depths of space, it's too cold. And happily now, over the past few years, quite a number of planetary systems are being discovered. We think perhaps one in 20 to one in 10 of all suitable stars might have a planetary system. This diagram, in fact, shows some of the most recently discovered. At the top, we have our own yeah. solar system with Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. The other ones only show giant planets, all that we can detect at the present time. There may be smaller ones there as well. Surprisingly, quite a number have very large planets, Jupiter-sized, very close to their sun. Yeah. We're not quite sure how that would no. affect the probability of life there. Of course, you've got to be at the right distance, too. You have. In our own solar system, we have Venus, perhaps a bit too hot, Mars, perhaps a bit too cold, the Earth just right. You have what's called an ecosphere, or a zone of habitability. And we have at least one planet, the Earth, in our own solar system. We hope that in other solar systems, perhaps at least one planet would be at about the right sort of temperature where water could exist on the surface. Yes, well, people are going to say, why should other beings be like us, and why should they necessarily have to have water? Well, it's a very good question. Life on Earth here is made up, in fact, of the most abundant elements in the universe, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. It's also based upon the most diverse and interesting chemistry of any element, that of carbon. So we suspect that the majority of other life forms would be based upon the same chemical building blocks as us. Now, it could be that there may be at least 100 million possible planets mm. in our galaxy now where the conditions for life might be suitable. And most astronomers now believe that wherever it is suitable, life will arise. It arose here on Earth almost as soon as the conditions became favorable. So we'd expect simple life forms to be very, very widespread in the galaxy. What we don't know, however, is mm. how often simple life forms can evolve into intelligent civilizations like ours. That could be common, in which case there might be up to a million other civilizations out there, or it could be very rare. We could perhaps be the only one. I wonder, well, how do you set about searching for other civilizations? Well, we're actually using radio waves to listen for very faint signals that might be coming from another planet out there in the galaxy. We suspect radio would be used because light waves would have to compete with the light of the bright star nearby. How long have we been trying? Well, the very first searches were made way back in 1960 when Frank Drake and his colleagues used an 85-foot telescope seen here at Green Bank in America. They made observations of the two nearest stars like our sun, Tau Ceti 
and Epsilon Eridani. In fact, they did pick up an unexplained signal, but later it was proved to have come from the then secret U2 spy plane. <laughs> it was a great, I remember, a great disappointment. It was. But how do you know which frequencies to examine? Well, we don't know that either, but there's a band of frequencies between where mobile phones and satellite television are used, where the background noise is least. And within that, there are two rather special yeah. frequencies. There's the hydrogen line, hydrogen the most abundant element in the universe. There's also a line from a special combination of hydrogen and oxygen called hydroxyl, or OH. Now together, hydrogen and OH make up water, H2O. Yeah. So we call this little band the water hole. And rather like in the jungle, animals tend to congregate in the water hole, at the water hole, we suspect that communications might try and communicate in that very same band. But it's still very, very wide. And if we use a single radio to gradually sweep across the band, like you can sort of hear happening here, it would take a very, very long time to do it. So in fact, we have a 56 million channel receiver, like having 56 million radios all working simultaneously. Even so, it takes about 90 minutes to step across the whole band we're observing in. It's an amazing process. Well, what kind of signal would you hope to pick up? Well, again, we don't really know, but we'd expect them to be very simple, rather like Morse huh. code. The sky now, I can read Morse too, are you just doing the war? <laughs> yes, in fact, signals like that can be detected over very great distances compared with either voice or television signals. So we have actually tried to contact other beings already? Yes, we have. In fact, even before radio was used, four spacecraft, two Pioneer and two Voyager craft, have actually left our solar system and moving out into interstellar space. And they carried messages so that if anybody ever came across them, they could learn something about us. On the sides of the Pioneer 10 spacecraft were plaques. The image there showed what we looked like, and because it was silhouetted against the outline of the spacecraft, how big we were. And at the bottom there, you can actually see the solar system with the sun on the left, and even the path of the spacecraft, showing which planet the spacecraft came from. Just above and to the left, it looks like a star on the picture. In fact, it's the direction of a number of pulsars, which are rather like interstellar yeah. Yeah. lighthouses, and their flash rates. And from that, anybody who found it could deduce which star our sun was. Rather like this. Last summer, I, I sailed across the channel at night, and halfway across, you could see about seven lighthouses mm, yeah. around. If I'd taken bearings of them with a prismatic compass like this, wrote down those bearings mm. along with the flash rates of the lighthouses, wrapped up that up, put it in a bottle, <laughs> threw it out to sea, if somebody picked that bottle up and they knew about lighthouses, they could deduce mm. precisely where I was. In the same way, any civilization that mm. picked the spacecraft up would know where the pulsars were, could tell which star in their heavens ours was. It's actually even more subtle than yes. that, because as time goes by, pulsars slow down, unlike lighthouses. They could even tell when the spacecraft left the Earth. Then, of course, there are the Voyagers, too. They're going out of the solar system. Exactly. Well, they were even more sophisticated. On the outside of a disk, they had the same map of the pulsars, but the disk was rather like a, a forerunner of a multimedia CD-ROM. It contained greetings in many languages, music and sound, and images showing our planet and, in fact, how we live. Now, I'm afraid it's unlikely that anyone is ever going to pick those particular spacecraft up. I feel so. It's a big lot of space out there. But in 1974, the giant 300-meter Arecibo radio telescope sent out a message towards the star cluster M13 in Hercules. You can just see it with the naked eye. Now, it was a very short message. It only took about three minutes to send. It'll actually take 25,000 years to reach M13.
And if some nice, kind operator picks it up and replies straight away, it'll take another 25,000 years. So we have to wait 50,000 years for that one. I'm afraid it, <laughs> interstellar communications are pretty slow. Very tedious. Well, how do you go about writing a code that's intelligible to anyone who might pick it up? Well, you've got to make it very simple to decode. And in fact, I've made a rather simpler version of the Arecibo message just to explain what you can do. The only thing that they'd know about it to start with is that it contained 667 noughts and ones, dots and dashes. Yeah. Now you've got to realize that if any other civilization did pick up such a message, they'd have mathematicians, astronomers, physicists, just like us, all of whom would work together to decode yeah. it. And almost immediately, I think the mathematicians would say, ah, that number 667 is rather special. It can only be divided by 23 and 29. It's the multiple of two prime yeah. numbers. That would suggest perhaps a grid. You could make the, the ones black and the whites naught and lay out the pattern in the form of a grid. There are still two ways of doing yes, it. Indeed. And if you do it one way, as we see here, you just get a rather random Not pattern of dots. But on the other hand, yes. if you do it the other way around, then a little picture emerges. And they'd all try and work together to understand what that picture meant. Now, just to make it easier, I've actually colored in the different parts of the picture. And up on the top left, you can actually see the blue. Now, a computer scientist would instantly say, oh, those are the binary numbers, 1 to 10. And those numbers also come up in the other parts of the picture. We've got ourselves a little red sort of person, a humanoid. And there are sort of two green little measuring height things. And the number 9. So perhaps we're 9 units of some length high. Of course, they don't have meter rules or, or foot <laughs> rulers, but they do know the wavelength at which the signal was received. They could work out that we were just under six foot tall. It actually might tell them a little bit about our planet, because if the planet were bigger, it would be more massive, yeah. it would have more gravity, we'd probably be rather squatter than we are at the present time. Underneath, you can actually see in yellow a little picture of our solar system. Not very good, but it does show the third planet out from the sun shifted up to show that we come from that particular planet. And then below that, a cross-section of the Arecibo telescope. The size which is given underneath is important because it would tell them how powerful a signal they need to transmit back to Earth for us to be able to receive it. Now, this picture shows the whole of the Arecibo message. You can see parts of my simpler one. At the top, there's some chemistry. And then there in blue, you can see the DNA, the double helix, the fundamental molecules of life. Well, Arecibo clearly is vital. But, um, you come from George Royal Bank with the Great Lovell Telescope. Where does that come into the picture? Well, we've become part of Project Phoenix, which is the continuation of the NASA SETI project. It's using two of the world's largest radio telescopes. The Arecibo Telescope makes the initial detections. But then the Lovell Telescope, operated by the University of Manchester at Jodrell Bank, has a vital role in eliminating sources of earthbound interference, particularly satellites, and confirming if a signal really is extraterrestrial. Because the Earth is rotating, and Jodrell's a long way away from Arecibo, if we both pick up a signal from a very distant object, we receive it at a somewhat lower frequency because of the Doppler shift. And this way, if we p both pick a signal up, we can know immediately where it's come from somewhere a very, very long way away. In fact, that makes it rather difficult to know whether the system's working properly. You're using Pioneer 10, aren't you? Well, exactly. Yes. Happily, it's still transmitting a 10-watt signal. It's six and a half billion miles away, way beyond Pluto. The signal's about 10 times the power of a mobile phone, but each day, we detect it, and we can prove the signal's still working, the whole system's operational. In fact, the little diagram here is showing how the frequency is gradually changing as a function of time, just like we'd expect a real extraterrestrial signal to do. Well, how did your first set of observations actually go? Well, we began in September. The first night, we detected the Pioneer signal, which was great, yes. and we then had 12 days of very good observations, obviously nothing discovered. But then we got a message from Arecibo. They were closing the whole place down. The astronomers were flying out of Puerto Rico because the predictions of the path of Hurricane George took it right over Puerto Rico. Those predictions, I'm afraid, were absolutely right. And the eye of the storm passed just a few miles away from the telescope. 
We heard nothing for a few days because all the communications were lost. We did them then by amateur radio, in fact. No one was hurt, but the telescope had, in fact, suffered some damage, and the result was it was out of action for a few weeks. We had to abandon our observations. We're starting again, though, in March this year. It might have been so much worse, it mightn't might it? well have been. Well, when you start again, um, how long are you going to continue? Well, for something like about five years, to observe the nearest a thousand stars like our sun in two periods, in March and September each year, each of about 20 nights. I'm sure beyond that, though, other searches will c carry on well into the future. But there are various other programmes going on now, aren't they, quite apart from yours? Oh, yes, at least another six. Two of them are quite interesting because you could actually take part in them yourselves. The University of Berkeley in Project Serendip is also using Arecibo. But the data it's getting, it's hoping to send out to people to analyze on their own home computers, making use of the fantastic amount of computer power around the world in our own homes. And in fact, the diagram here shows the screensaver that would actually be on your screen showing you how the data is processed. So that'd be quite exciting. Starts in April. Also, you could actually build your own radio telescope, about three meters or four meters in size, and become part of Project Argus run by the SETI League. The hope is that they'd have about 500 telescopes all around the world keeping a continuous look on the sky. Well, Ian, it's all very exciting. Let me ask you a direct question. Do you think you're going to have any success? Well, the million dollar question. If the optimists like Carl Sagan are right, there should be many thousands of other civilizations and I would hope that before long we would come in contact with them. That would perhaps be one of the most dramatic discoveries ever made. On the other hand, if life doesn't often evolve to form a technological civilization like ours, there may not be many other people that we could contact out there. It could be that life, capable of looking out at the wonders of our universe like we can, could be quite rare. We might be rather special. We might indeed. Well, the search is going on. Have you any particular problems to face? Well, there is one problem that satellites partly now for mobile phones, partly for the use in the future of the internet, are beginning to use up that part of the spectrum where we're trying to observe. It's rather like a curtain being drawn over a window. It may be in the far future we'll have to make our observations from the back of the moon. Well, I wonder just how long can we go on and shall we ever succeed? But it will be a most tremendous thing with we'll alter all our philosophy, yeah. all our outlook. So it is a, a very worthwhile program. Thank you. I think it's a measure of our changed attitude that's regarded as worth doing at all. So Absolutely. one day, let's hope we really do prove there are other beings up there. Thank you. Ian, thank you very much. Well, don't forget, it is now newsletter time. If you want the newsletter, send your stamp envelope to newsletter number 72, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W127TS. And of course, the latest astronomical information, you have our Sky Night information line, 0891 or you can tune into CFAX, page 620. And next month, we're going to look at something rather different. Uh, are there asteroids liable to collide with the Earth? And if so, could amateurs help in discovering them? Well, um, it's an interesting topic. Next month, I'll be joined by the president of the BAA, Martin Bobbley, and we're going to talk about asteroid hunting. So until then, good night.